Hello students, this is Professor Crockmall here, learning module number two, the second presentation I'll make to you. This week we're doing, I'm using Prezi, which is an online software for presentations. It's like PowerPoint, just a little bit different. I like how it looks on the screen. I'm recording on Camtasia and we'll be editing and then uploading that into the Blackboard. I hope you've had a good week and if you had Labor Day, a great day off and I uh, hope that you have checked into Blackboard frequently, are making comments and sharing. It's part of how we take a look at what your performance is. So make sure you take care of that and don't wait till the last minute. All right, this week's presentation we're going to talk about communication technology, the information age, information overload, and how to manage it. From the cave to the cloud is a fast look at 200,000 years of human history and communication start with a little bit of uh, context for you. So in the beginning, 13.7 billion years ago, that's what we estimate the time as we know it's going from the Big Bang to the present. This is a uh, illustration from NASA and we are on the right hand side on the ever expanding circle but we're just a blip in time. So let's do a quick look about humanity. The Earth's history is about 4 billion years. Humanity, Homo sapiens, been around for a few billion, million years. Let's take a look at one of the most important things, and that's fire. And that's from the archaeological record tells us man and fire were associated for about 1.6 million years ago. We found fire pits in association with remnants of humanity. So that's where we start there. And fire is a really important place to think about. In uh, those times that we were able to do fire, you're able to cook food, get more nutrition out of it. But more than that, it's light, it's heat, and it's a social gathering spot around the fire at night when it's dark out there, keeps the beasties away, able to eat to cook food. And then the social uh, inventions started coming around. So in those days, social ability to communicate was verbal. And so uh, the cool kids around the fire are the one who had the great stories, who were able to sing and able to dance. And so that's how the oral tradition started and we can trace that to 1.6 million years ago with the fire. So this archaeological study of the Bushmen in Africa looking at how they socialized around fire suggests that the stories told over firelight helped human culture and thought evolve. And the great quote was from the principal investigator for the study was by the U University of Utah. Stories are told in virtually all hunter-gatherer societies. Together with gifts, they were the original social media. That's Polly Wisner. So now let's go from 1.6 million years ago to about 40,000 years ago. We start seeing images playing a part. These are cave drawings, and these are from Maros in southern Sulawesi. It's a large island east of Borneo and thought to be the oldest cave drawings at 40,000 years old. So we see a hand there, and the artist has taken pigment and dusted it off to show that his hand was there. That's a real sign of humanity. And then there's a representation of a pig deer. We're not really sure how to interpret these things, but we can certainly see that it's visual. Then we go from 40,000 to about 12,000 years ago with the development of agriculture, so the ability to get food and not have to be hunter-gatherers or nomadics allow the population to expand from 5 million to about 7 billion today and based on the ability to harness the land and grow crops and grow animals and feed larger and larger populations. It also had uh, a, a real effect on society and the social units. From there we go to about that time we also find archaeological evidence that maps were there and these predate writing. This is an etching on a piece of ivory that shows a river and a settlement near it. That's a map. About 7,000 years ago, the development of writing came. The Sumerians used it for really for business purposes. This is a cuneiform, and it's basically a, a mud tablet, clay tablet, and they use a, a stylus with a little triangle in the end of it, and they could draw these pictures. This particular one is said to have uh, can document three deliveries of beer to a palace and a temple, and also gives the exact quantities of barley and other ingredients used in brewing. Some people have taken that recipe and created a Sumerian beer. I've never tasted it, never seen it, but it sounds interesting. 
Then we have the development of paper about 105 AD. Tsai Lun gets credit for it. He reported the invention of paper to the Chinese emperor. And paper is really a vegetable product. It's made from plants and it's processed very labor intensive to make a sheet of paper. If you've never done it, it's kind of fun to do. You can use rags, you can use paper, and you put it all together and you put it in hot water anyway before going. I, I've done it. My mom makes her Christmas cards every year from paper. So then we have about a thousand years later the development of paper mills. Water-powered paper mills and paper making centers grew in Italy, mechanizing the making of paper and cutting the price to one-sixth that of parchment. So you have these two technologies. You have parchment and paper. Now all of a sudden paper is much cheaper. It's still a tool used by the elites of society. It's not something that's available to everybody. Even though we see writing coming in 7,000 years ago, still paper is something of the elites, the churches, the, go in the governors you know, uh, educated people were writing with paper, using paper. Then we have the biggest things to happen in communications is the printing press. Johannes Gutenberg, a goldsmith by trade, created the movable press, and his innovation was treating typesetting and printing as separate work steps. So he was a, a goldsmith, and he was able to come up with a matrix and w make type in it, and then set the type, put ink on top of it, put a piece of paper, and use the screw press to do this and mechanize the process of creating books. So, and also another thing you think about is the Latin alphabet. So there's a couple of dozen characters and punctuation and spaces, and all of a sudden you're able to encode ideas, create ideas, and do this at getting toward mass. So what we're seeing was um, scribes were losing their jobs, sadly, uh, and printing was growing. So that in 40 years, there was 100 printers throughout Europe, and they had recorded some 20 million books produced by 1500. That's just a revolution. So the first 60 years or so, they're not creating new books. They're just using the books that had been done before, the Bible and other books like that. But then you start seeing innovation coming in, people creating new works and growth. You can trace the printing press to the, the Renaissance, the Reformation of the Church, and the, just the blossoming of humanity with the ability to share information and make information portable. Let's move fast forward to 1840, and Samuel Morse, who was a professor at NYU, patented his electromagnetic telegraph technology. He sent the message, What hath God wrought? from the Supreme Court chambers in Washington, D.C. to Baltimore in 1844. He got the U.S. Post Office to pay for this 50-mile telegraph line to use for this first test. He then offered the technology to the Post Office for $100,000. They turned it down, so Morris was left to commercialize the technology and the creation of Western Union, which became the power in communications. Now, the telegraph was sent one message, and they used dots and dashes, so it's electrical. And you can see the technology here for using that, and you've seen it in the movies, you tap, 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 dots and dashes. And so that sent a message. In the Mexican-American War, the telegraph really came to its own for being able for journalists to use and for also the government to understand what was going on with the war and get messages about troop movements. It also developed what we call the inverted pyramid in journalism where the most important stuff goes at the top of the story and it's get less and less important as it goes through. That was in case you wanted to send a message, you had the most important stuff come through. If the wires got cut, the message would still be you get the most important things first transmitted. So that's something that's still in the use today in journalism. So there to the next. This is another wired technology. The telegraph was wired. The telephone was wired. On March 10, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell spoke into a device connected to a device in another room, and he said, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. Thus was the beginning of the telephone era. Well, before he could go to really go full out on this, he had to fight off a patent uh, litigation from Elisha Gray, who had filed his patent just hours after Bell did. And Bell prevailed, and he was able to then create uh, the first phone line from Boston to Somerville, Mass., which is about three miles, 1887. First Bell Company, 1878. Numbers were assigned to subscribers instead of names in 1879. And AT&T was incorporated in 1885. Boston and New York were connected in 1894. Then then AT&T acquired Western Union in 1911. In uh, 1915, 
Alexander Graham Bell made a 23-minute phone call across the country from New York to San Francisco. That was the first transcontinental phone call. That's a big event. He died in 1922, and phone lines went quiet for a minute to remember these, this inventor. Some of the other things, 10 million Bell system phones were in service in 1918. And um, the first mobile system was developed in 1946 and used, and that was really to connect cars. That was the, the idea of mobile then, and it was not a portable device that we know now. The AT, uh, Bell Lab. So, from the wired technology of the telephone, we then go to wireless technology. So, Marconi sent and received his first radio signal in 1895 and then he got the patent for it. He saw radio as a point-to-point -point communications business with dots and dashes so ships at sea would be able to talk to land or talk to each other and we saw Marconi's invention playing a role in the sinking in the Titanic when they were able to dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 SOS were sinking at sea and some of the passengers were able to be rescued. But Marconi didn't have the vision for radio as we know it today. And part of that came through the development of three people that we want to talk about. So Reginald Fessenden invented a way to transmit voice and music by altering the intensity of waves called amplitude modulation. That's this way. That's AM radio. And American radio engineer Edwin Har Howard Armstrong found by varying wave frequency instead of amplitude, stations could avoid the interference that often corrupted AM transmissions, thus FM radio. But the most interesting guy is Westinghouse engineer Frank Conrad, and he's credited with transmitting the first regular AM broadcast in the U.S. from his East Pittsburgh garage. His show aired every Wednesday and Saturday. He gave some sports scores, some talk, but it was mostly music. He played records, and when he ran out of records, he stuck a deal, struck a deal with a local store to supply him with more in return for on-air promotions. These are believed the first radio ads. Then came the advent of television, another wireless technology. So Philo Farnsworth, who was born in Utah and envisioned the technology that was become to television at a very, very early age. At age 21, on September 7, 1927, he made the first electronic transmission of television using a carbon arc projector to send a single smoky line to the receiver in the next room of his apartment in San Francisco. He and his wife, Emma Pem Farnsworth, were uh, quite the team. Her image was the first human image that was sent on TV, and that was done in October of 1929. It was transmitted, and then she helped make the first tubes for the company and did all the virtual the company's technical sketches during its early years. So Philo ended up having a hundred patents, and he was very aggressive in protecting his intellectual property. So he was embroiled in a lot of patent lawsuits, infringement. And in 1939, he won a million dollars from RCA, which is the Radio Corporation of America, for a settlement on patent infringement. So that really, really settled, firmed up his hold on the patents for television as we know it. From there, we go to the Internet, which started as a Department of Defense research project, and they wanted to create a system that would be uh, strong and impenetrable in case of a nuclear war. So goes the popular legend. And in 1969, they connected the computers from UCLA in the Los Angeles area, Santa Barbara, which was close by, Stanford up in the Bay Area of California, and University of Utah. That was the first, it was called ARPANET then, and it developed and grew, and more and more computing centers came online. Most From there, we go to the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee was a child of a computer scientist. He was a scientist in his own right. He was a software engineer working at CERN in Switzerland. He had an idea that would help scientists communicate more effectively. He wrote it up, sent it to his boss, who got a reply back. Vague, but exciting. So and he, his boss also gave Tim, Tim Berners-Lee time to work on the project, and he was an efficient user, user of time for sure. In 1990, he released the first software for the internet browser. He created hypertext markup language, HTML. The HTTP 
uh, protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, and he also came up with universal re in uh, universal resource locators, which is you know as URLs. So he really came up with the architecture of the World Wide Web, and he made an interesting decision. Instead of like all the other inventors that we saw that had to spend time in court and angst of court cases for their patents, he made it open source. He gave it away. Now. He uh, he's he's regarded as a Rothschild, so uh, incredibly smart guy, and he made this decision. And you know he's he's he does okay. He's written books. He was knighted by the Queen. He's well respected. I've seen him talk, and it's like uh, watching a rock star is like Steve Jobs talking too. Twenty five years, the World Wide Web has really become a, a super effective tool. But we're in in the age of change, and change continues. In 2002, the first year where the world's digital storage capacity became larger with analog storage capacity. So they say we can store 295 exabytes of information. That's 295 followed by 20 zeros. That's according to a USC study in 2007. It's just some notes. 1973, the first portable cell phone call was made by Martin Cooper of Motorola to his competitor, Joel Engel of Bell Labs. In 1978, public tests of a new cellular phone system. This is in Chicago. They set up towers, and you have to remember, cellular is a radio technology. Did you know that? And they set it up, and they tested it, and it worked well. That was constructed by AT&T and Bell Labs. And then in 1981, Motorola did a test of its own in Baltimore and Washington, and the FCC in 1982 approved uh, commercial cell phone services, and by 2000, we had 100 million telephone subscribers. Another technology you should note about is voice over internet protocols. So it used to be phone calls were made over the wire, the copper wire of the telephone system. VOIP made it possible to communicate digitally, turn voice into digital that could be sent over the digital networks, whether it's the internet or fiber or optics. Um, just one thing, if you want to see this, on, when I share this Prezi, you can click on that and you can listen to an interview with Martin Cooper. I talked to him a couple of years ago about social media and the changes that it could bring to the world, the world's problems. What would he solve? You can click on that and find out. In 2004, the social web came online with the opening of Facebook. Now, Facebook started in Harvard, and then it was expanded to the Ivy Leagues, and then it was expanded to colleges, and then it was open to the public. And we've seen a tremendous growth. Uh, just recently, Facebook announced that a billion users used it on one day out of the world's population. We know it to be 7 billion. One-seventh of them are on Facebook, one in seven people. Now, the next 6 billion people are going to be the challenge for Facebook to bring online. They say that Facebook may have all the people online that they could possibly have. But 2004 is Facebook. Then we have real-time social media in 2006 when Twitter was brought online, originally designed to service bicycle messengers in an urban environment. It has certainly become something more than that. It's open, Facebook is closed. Twitter is available to the world. Facebook, you can't see somebody unless they choose to let you see it through their profile. Wearables, 2014, 2015, wearable computers on your wrist. They haven't taken off like people thought they would, but still with Apple in the market, you can be assured that this is a powerful tool. In fact, so powerful, the New York Times is now designing one-sentence stories to see on your wearable, and then you could take more information on your smartphone or go to your desktop. In the spring of 2015, two apps came to the market that allowed for live streaming in real time from a mobile device. We, it was, that's not new, but they really popularized it, changed really the paradigm and how we can share what we're doing in real time over. So we have the Internet of Things in 2020. What is the Internet of Things? Well, it's known as IoT, and it's a, it's a vision where things have connections to the Internet, inanimate objects. Uh, things like a smoke detector in your house might be connected through the Internet to the fire department, the closest fire department if the smoke detector goes off. And the fire department is notified, and they come, or they call you, contact you, say you got a problem. You say yes, they come quickly. It's a way to deliver services. It's a way to get part of the big data. You've heard big data? That's the Internet of Things is part of it. And it's just really in its early stages. They're thinking about how they can do it. So all of this adds up to the attention. We have all this so much information available. 
what becomes valuable and its attention and we can certainly see that mobile devices are increasing the amount of attention people spend with them two hours and 21 minutes a day with a mobile device is the American average compared to four hours and 31 minutes with TV that's according to a 2013 study by eMarketer time spent with TV has been relatively flat over the years from 2010 to 2013, about four hours a day. Meantime, time spent with mobile is one of these measures has gone from 20 minutes in 2010 and doubled every year after that. And that trend is still continuing. We spend more and more time. We're seeing a new age develop, I say. So, and the web and all of the communications are really visual. If you want attention on social media, add a picture. Video. So let's talk about pictures. So one trillion photographs were estimated to have been taken in 2014 out of some 5.7 trillion pictures taken cumulatively in the history of photography. Most were taken on smartphones. And this is from Tommy Ahonen, a former Nokia executive who is now a mobile analyst. Tech adoption. We're in adopting technology, as you can see in this this age, starting with the telephone, which took 35 years until one quarter of the American population used it. Radio, 31 years. TV, 26 years. Mobile phone, 13 years. The World Wide Web, 7 years. Smartphones just took 3 years for one quarter of the population to use them. One quarter of the global population will have a smartphone by the end of 2015 and half of the population by 2018 according to some estimates. You should know Moore's Law. Computer chips double in power every 18 months. On the high end and on the low end they go cut in half by price. So you see the low end chips are used in things like computers, game stations, and those kind of things are, are getting cheaper. While on the high end, the really great chips are getting more and more powerful, double in power every two months, every 18 months. And then we have Metcalf's Law. Robert Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, and that's what he used to plug into the wall to get connected to the internet. Now we do it on Wi-Fi. But he says the power of a network increases by the square of the number of nodes connected to it. So if you have one node, that's one to the second, that's one. If you have two nodes, that's two to the second, that's four. Four nodes, four to the second, that's four times four, that's 16. You see how that power curve is a hockey stick, and that's really what you need to know about networks. They get more powerful the more people that you get on them. So we're in the information age. Individuals are empowered to publish, to create a virtual self, and connect with others and instantly access information they could never access before. So there's more to know, and more can know it. Socially, it's changing how jobs are. Really, the, the jobs that we used to have are changing. The in industry is going away. Maybe there's some hope with 3D printing and creating things, but it's really about a knowledge economy and knowledge workers, or else it's either low-end service jobs. There's a rending of the old ways and new leaders are rising. You go to Google, go to Facebook, and you'll see the power there is in the software engineers, people who can create things, code software. Are you informed? Watch Jimmy Fallon when he does Lie Witness News. They send people out to talk about current events with people on the street. They kind of lie with the current events, and the people on the street just buy into it, and it's a great and funny thing to know. Knowledge is knowing what we cannot know. That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. And then what's an informed citizen? So this Alfred Schutz, who was a philosopher and a sociologist, really posited there's three levels of knowing. There's the expert, and there's the person on the street, and in between is where you want to be. You want to be the well-informed citizen with an idea of things generally, but also be able to think critically and, and really be that well-informed, and that's what we strive to be here here. So how can we do what we need to do and do it better? Here, just in time or just in case? So here's some hints for you. And this is um, really information hacks, and I love hacks. Structure your searches. Use Boolean search. Find the right resources. Be really critical in what you select to use for your sources. Create actionable collections with bookmarks. Aggregate information on key topics. Always be collecting, ABC. Learn to speed read. Watch demo videos. Search a great source of information. YouTube is like the second most popular search engine in the world. Focus like a laser. Trim the fat in other areas. In other words, don't go off and put a Facebook update or a tweet. Send out a tweet. Focus on what you're doing. Work for 90 minutes. Take a break. Then uh, you know, look away from the screen. Look into the distance. Take a breath. Maybe jog in place. Those are things that...
All right, let's take a look at the assignments for the week. You're going to have a blog assignment, and this one will be a video assignment. So you use Camtasia or Screencast-O-Matic or a video capture software tool. Walk us through three online platforms that you use on a daily basis. Talk about the pros and cons and the type of information or collaboration on each forum. Share your thoughts on whether you feel better informed, less informed, or overwhelmed by the information across your chosen resources. Respond to at least two classmate submissions. Voice thread, and I remind you to read all these things in your learning module. Can you survive and do your work without the use of the internet? Does social media matter to your lives? Is it important to our future? What's your favorite social media platform? What kind of conversations do you have on it? What's the best experience you've had using it? And the worst experience, and what do you think can be improved? Comment on at least two classmates' discussion submissions. That's all I have for you for the week. We'll see you next week.